Welcome back to another weekly spaceflight update with me. We've got lots to cover today, as usual, with development of SpaceX's Starship, some big news from Rocket Lab, and we've had some new information regarding the status of Blue Origin's long-delayed BE-4 engine for ULA's Vulcan rocket. There's a few launches to discuss as well, so let's get right into things. Last week I talked about the final stacking of Ship 22, and over the past week this was completed and the brand new beast was rolled out for the world to see, before promptly being sent to the graveyard of retired prototype vehicles. I can only assume that this is due to Ship 22 only being compatible with Raptor 1, an engine that SpaceX no longer produce, and therefore it can't fly. SpaceX is currently building quite the collection of scrapped vehicles it seems. It was asked on Twitter if SpaceX could consider donating a Starship prototype to a public space for people to see it up close, and Elon replied with a yes, suggesting they could send one over to Brownsville Airport, to which the airport said they'd be happy to accept. Elon then simply stated that SpaceX will send one over, whether this will be Ship 22, 16, 15 or Booster 5 remains to be seen. Maybe they could send a ship and Booster 5 and have a full stack display, like the Saturn V exhibitions at the Johnson & Kennedy Space Centers. SpaceX already have something of a relationship with the airport, as they use a chunk of its land to store Starship hardware. Now, while we're discussing the SpaceX rocket garden, look what showed up there! A wild Raptor 2 was spotted. I think seeing how big it is next to this gigantic pickup truck really does a good job of showing the scale of these things. It's easy to think of these engines as being small, but in reality they're enormous. As you can see, it's on what appears to be a ceremonial truck trailer with that big starbase lettering, and that's because it was wheeled out and showcased for the Charo Days Parade on February the 26th. Here's a picture of it out and about by Siu Nunez Images. Siu Nunez Images is actually a huge reason I'm able to make this Starship coverage. It can be incredibly difficult to acquire usage rights of photos and videos of Starbase, and his images have always been a huge compliment to these videos. Elon Musk has also endorsed them multiple times as well. I for one think they make great wallpapers. I would highly recommend checking out his Twitter and his website, where all his photos are available for sale in many formats such as canvas, metal, and even wooden prints, among others. Anyway, moving Moving on, Zach Golden caught this interesting shot of a future ship's nose comb being assembled. This picture is kind of curious for two reasons. Firstly, what's up with that red nose? It's really hard to make out what the material is. If you have any ideas, then I'd love to hear them in the comments below. The second thing that makes this shot interesting is that, according to Zach, SpaceX quickly shut the door when they saw that a photographer was outside. This picture was taken 45 seconds after the first one was taken. Coincidence? Or is there something here that SpaceX don't want to be seen by prying eyes? Zack then drove around to the other side of the building, and within moments the other door was shut as well. Interesting stuff. Zack goes by the brand name CSI Starbase Online, and he's quickly becoming a really valuable source for Starship coverage. I would highly recommend checking out his Twitter and Patreon pages if you want to show him some support. And hey, if you like the video that you're watching right now, then I always appreciate a like down below, and if you want to join the gang and subscribe, then you'll get these videos in your feed every single Monday so that you always stay up to date with space news. Now, last week we mentioned the woes that SpaceX have been experiencing with the orbital tank farm. We believe that the two vertical methane tanks are not actually compliant with Texas laws, and that SpaceX legally can't use them for methane storage. We have seen them fuel up the two adjacent horizontal fuel tanks though, so at least this part of the farm is okay. And it's expanding! Last week we saw the delivery of five more massive horizontal tanks for the farm, though I'm almost more impressed by the skill it must take to drive the incredibly long truck and trailer to deliver them. SpaceX then quickly began began building an enclosure wall around the tanks in order to meet regulations. Look at how big the wide bay is now! SpaceX have finished stacking the main wall segment, and it's now the tallest building in Brownsville. SpaceX just need to add the roof, and of course install a permanent stairway and bridge crane. We should hopefully see all of this happen in the next week or so, and I'm really looking forward to seeing SpaceX start assembling vehicles in this thing. SpaceX performed their first Starlink launch after their previous mission on the 3rd of February, which ended with the loss of 38 out of the 49 satellites deployed, due to a solar storm that increased atmospheric drag at the low altitudes that the satellites were placed into. For last week's mission, a different approach was taken. For this launch, the second stage performed a second burn, placing the satellites into a higher Earth orbit of around 330 kilometers, presumably to reduce atmospheric drag. The extra delta V required for this maneuver may explain why the Falcon 9 only carried 46 satellites to space instead of the usual 49. 
As for the Falcon 9 first stage, it successfully touched down on the drone chip and in doing so became the second ever Falcon 9 to complete 11 launches and landings, which, to me at least, is still absolutely crazy. While it's certainly become more routine to see, I still don't feel that the novelty of seeing these massive boosters land themselves like this has entirely worn off, especially with the knowledge of how these descents are effectively suicide burns, or hover slams, since the Falcon 9 booster isn't actually able to achieve hover, so it needs to time its deceleration burn perfectly so that its velocity reaches zero at the exact moment of touchdown. Keeping to the topic of Starlink, later on in the week we saw another Starlink launch. This again carried a lower number of satellites than usual, 50 as opposed to 52, so that the payload could be deployed to a higher initial orbit. Man, we really are getting to airliner levels of routine with Falcon 9 at this stage, incredible to see. Last week we also saw a couple of Long March launches from China. On the 26th of February, a Long March 4C launched the LSAR-01B satellite, which is designed to orbit at an altitude of 600 kilometers and will be used to monitor the geological environment, landslides and earthquakes. On the 27th of February, a Long March 8Y2 launched 22 small satellites from the Wenchang spacecraft launch site. The 22 satellites, according to official state sources, will mainly be used for commercial remote sensing services, marine environment monitoring, forest fire prevention and disaster mitigation. Now this next part of the video covers a less positive and a bit more of a sensitive subject and that's the ongoing war in Ukraine and the implications for ongoing space operations. If you want to just skip this part of the video then there is a timecode on screen. US President Joe Biden declared on Thursday that Russia's space program won't be shielded from US sanctions in the wake of Russia's invasion, stating that his government estimates that they'll cut off over half of Russia's high-tech imports and this will strike a blow to their ability to continue modernizing their military. It will degrade their aerospace industry, including their space program. We've so far not had any elaboration on what specific sanctions or restrictions will be imposed on Russia's space program, other than the fact that the US will deny Russia exports of sensitive technology, primarily targeting Russian defense, aviation and maritime sectors, to cut off Russia's access to cutting-edge technology. One area of uncertainty this leaves us in is the International Space Station, which of course is in part operated by Russia. So far, NASA have stated that the new export control measures will allow continued US-Russia space cooperation, and that they they have no plans to make changes to their support for ongoing in-orbit and ground station operations. Here in the UK, Prime Minister Boris Johnson has stated that for now, he remains broadly in favour of continuing artistic and scientific collaboration with Russia, but in the current circumstances it is hard to see how even this can continue as normal, so it remains to be seen what happens here. Director General of Roscosmos Dmitry Rogozin responded to President Biden's statement over Twitter. He highlighted that the International Space Station's orbit is sustained by Russian Progress spacecraft, and he added that if the United States were to destroy their cooperation with the ISS, then who would save the ISS from an uncontrolled deorbit and fall into the United States or Europe, adding that the station doesn't fly over Russia, so only the US and its allies would be threatened. He also noted that there is the prospect that the 500-ton station could impact India or China. Luckily, the ISS is not at the absolute mercy of Roscosmos. The United States segment provides key functions for the station, and, as I covered in last week's episode of Space This Week, the recently launched Cygnus cargo spacecraft that arrived at the ISS on the 21st will conduct a test to reboost the station as an alternative to a Russian Progress spacecraft. The berthing of the spacecraft was successful, and it delivered just over 3.5 tons of research, crew supplies, and hardware. In a further severing of ties with Roscosmos, all Soyuz launches from French Guiana have been halted, as announced by Russia on the 26th of February. They will be withdrawing the 87 employees that support the Soyuz launches there. This hopefully won't have too great of an impact on ESA and Ariane space operations. The Ariane 6 and Vega C rockets are both expected to make their debut flights this year and together can hopefully entirely replace the role performed by the Soyuz launcher at French Guiana. We have to be grateful that NASA has the Crew Dragon for manned missions. Without this, they wouldn't be able to send crew to the International Space Station at all, meaning that they'd either have to submit to any Russian demands or just abandon the station completely. Speaking of SpaceX in this conflict, Elon Musk has stated on Twitter that SpaceX can provide ISS orbit maintenance if Russia decides to halt the progress missions, and Starlink services are now active in Ukraine with more terminals en route. Moving along now, in the world of private spaceflight, last week Rocket Lab released a video of their new launch pad at the Mahia Peninsula. 
CEO Peter Beck stated that this new pad will effectively double Rocket Lab's launch cadence. Pad B is largely similar to Pad A, but with some small improvements that have apparently been made to make it slightly more efficient, though what these upgrades are wasn't really elaborated on too much. In the video, Peter Beck reiterated that the launch complex isn't just the launch pads themselves, but there are also a number of clean rooms and range control facilities, all of which are owned and operated entirely by Rocket Lab without the need from any help from government facilities. I would expect that a big driving force for Rocket Lab to get a second pad operational in order to increase their potential launch cadence is to step up their ability to compete with the ever-growing smallsat launcher market. Falcon 9's transport emissions will have definitely imposed some fierce competition, and of course Astra's Rocket 3 can supposedly deliver similar orbital payloads to Electron at a lower cost to the consumer. Of course, Rocket 3 is still working through a couple of developmental issues, but it's not going to be long before it's reliably flying regularly. Luckily, Rocket Lab have a lot of pedigree, having launched over 100 satellites to orbit so far. They've definitely been in the game for a while now, and in fact, Peter Beck reminded us in the video that Rocket Lab's launch complex was the world's first and to date only private orbital launch site. For now, at least. <laughs> Rocket Lab also unveiled their new logo, which Peter Beck feels is a great improvement over the original one, which he shared was something he doodled during a flight from LAX on the day he decided to start Rocket Lab. While we're on the subject of private spaceflight, we've had a brief snippet of news about Blue Origin. Sadly, we never really get too much information about Blue Origin's development progress like we do with, say, Starship, as they have a much more restricted and secretive development process. However, it's not a great secret that the BE-4 engine that's currently being developed by Blue Origin, which will be used for United Launch Alliance's upcoming Vulcan rocket, has been facing numerous teething problems and delays. Many were starting to doubt, in fact, that Vulcan would even be able to fly at all this year. Luckily, those fears have been somewhat put to rest, as Tori Bruno confirmed on Twitter that the engines are indeed real <laughs> and getting built in Blue Origin's factory, and testing is yielding better results than expected. He remains confident that Vulcan is still on track to launch this year. While we're talking about engine news, NASA conducted another test fire of the RS-25 engine that'll be used on the SLS rocket on the 24th of February. This is the fourth hot fire test of the engine, and the objective here was to gather performance data on a variety of new engine components and manufacturing techniques, all of which were implemented to both reduce the amount of time required to build the engines and also bring down the cost. The engine was fired for a full duration of eight and a half minutes, which is about the same amount of time the engines will operate during an actual launch. A launch, by the way, that hopefully we're all still excited about. I certainly can't wait to see SLS fly. I keep seeing a lot of SLS versus Starship on the internet. Meanwhile, I'm just sitting here like, it's amazing to have both, right? The launch is going to be great, and I can't wait to cover it on a future episode of Space This Week. For now, though, I'm going to leave today's episode there. Thank you all so much for watching, and especially big thanks to my Patreon supporters and channel members whose names are now on screen. If you want your name to be on this list, then there are buttons to sign up below. You get ad-free versions of my videos on Patreon, as well as early access for both Patreons and channel members. Anyway, I've rattled on for far too long, so I'll sign off right there. Goodbye.